there are a lot of different kinds of problem solving in chemistry, and many problems have lots of different ways to solve them. There is, however, one particular strategy that is remarkably successful for a ridiculous number of quantitative problems in chemistry, dimensional analysis. The steps to dimensional analysis are, write down what you know, multiply by one, repeat step two as often as necessary, and then arrive at your answer. Now, when I list the steps this way, steps one to three sound completely useless, and step four sounds like magic. What I'm going to show you, though, is how careful, clever use of step two can take this process, which sounds like it does absolutely nothing, and turn it into a powerful problem-solving tool. So let's think about this step two for a minute. What do I mean when I say multiply by one, and how can we be careful and clever as we do it? Well, let's start by expanding what we mean by the concept of one. Remember, any fraction where the numerator equals the denominator is equal to one. So if I take two over two, that's one. If I take pi over pi, that's one. If I take alligator over alligator, that's one. It doesn't matter what the top and bottom are. If they're the same, the fraction is one. Now also remember that when we multiply by one, we haven't changed the number. Four times one is four. You already know one way to combine these ideas. Take three fourths, and multiply it by 2 over 2, which has the value of 1, to get 6 eighths. In this example, 3 fourths equals 6 eighths, just written in a different form. Now for the clever part. The numerator and the denominator do not have to be in the same units. In fact, for dimensional analysis to work, they have to be in different units. So let's see how to use that to solve a problem. Suppose you have 12 feet of rope, and you want to know how many inches long it is. Now, forget that you already know just to multiply by 12. I'm deliberately starting with an easy example so that you can see the process. Step 1, write down what you know, 12 feet. Step 2, multiply by 1. In this case, we're going to multiply by 12 inches over 1 foot. Now, hang on a second. Why is that 1? Well, 12 inches equals 1 foot. Let's divide both sides by 1 foot. Cancel out the right-hand side, and you have 12 inches over 1 foot equals 1. So, back to our original problem. We are multiplying our starting 12 feet by 12 inches over 1 foot. So now notice that the units of feet cancel. It's kind of like how in A times B over B, the Bs cancel, leaving just A. We don't need step 3 because we only need one conversion, and so we're already at step 4 arriving at our answer, 144 inches. How did we know to write inches over feet rather than feet over inches? Both of them equal one, but notice that if you do it the wrong way, you end up with units of feet squared over inches, which doesn't make any sense. Just arrange your conversion factors so that the units cancel and you'll be fine. Now let's get a little more complicated. The real power in dimensional analysis comes when you chain multiple conversions together. So how many seconds are in one year? We'll assume it's a non-leap year for simplicity. So start with what you know and start putting in conversion factors to get yourself step-by-step step, closer to the answer you're looking for. Notice that each fraction equals one and that the fractions are arranged so that the units you are converting from just get canceled out. The next level of complexity is compound units, like velocities. Suppose we want to convert miles per hour to meters per second. This is no different from what you've done already. You just have to keep track of both units you are converting. So first we'll convert from miles to meters, and then we'll convert from hours to minutes, and minutes to seconds. If you really need to, you can cross out the canceling units but eventually you will probably become comfortable enough with this process that you can drop that step. But whatever you do, do not drop writing the units in the first place. If you do, I guarantee that you will get lost and that a teaching assistant or professor trying to grade your work will similarly get lost, leaving you with no possibility of partial credit. Another common type of compound unit is where you have units raised to a power, such as in volumes. In dealing with these types of problems, remember that centimeter cubed means centimeter times centimeter times centimeter. So we need to apply the conversion factor from centimeters to meter three times. 
You can write this in other ways, of course, including cubing the whole conversion factor. While this is tempting to do, I personally discourage it. I know that I will often make the mistake of missing the exponent when I've got the whole thing written down and I'm typing it into my calculator. A compromise approach would be to go ahead and cube the number. Regardless, all of these approaches are mathematically equivalent and give the same answer. Chemistry also has many instances of using derived units. In this example, we have two different ways to express units of energy. The joule, which is a kilogram square meter per square second, and the erg, which is a gram square centimeter per square second. So let's see how we might convert 12.3 ergs to joules. First, we need to get out of ergs, so we use the definition of an erg as our conversion factor. This can get hard to follow as we cancel out units, though, since there are negative exponents involved. That's easy to fix by moving the units with negative exponents across the fraction line and switching the sign. With this revised version of the units, tracking what cancels with what should be pretty straightforward. Now we simply convert all of the units into what we need for joules. Grams become kilograms, centimeters become meters. Finally, we convert to joules, using the definition of a joule as a conversion factor. Just as we did with ergs, we can simplify this conversion factor by dealing with the negative exponents and get an expression in the end where everything cancels correctly. Finally, we can calculate the answer. Very often, introductory chemistry classes will teach dimensional analysis using the railroad method, where you write the conversion factor across a single line and use each column as one conversion factor. I discourage this approach for two reasons. First, it obscures the fundamental process that's going on. Each step is a multiplication step. This is simple algebra, so why not use algebraic notation? Second, the notation is very difficult to use in a situation where you are solving an equation rather than simply doing a conversion. Let's look at an example of using dimensional analysis to solve an equation, and hopefully you'll see that it's not clear how the railroad method could be applied easily to it. So this example we're going to look at is a key equation you've already encountered, the ideal gas law. This is a simple equation, PV equals nRT, where P represents the pressure, V is the volume, N is the quantity of material measured in moles, T is the temperature in units of Kelvin, and R is a constant that's shown here. Notice the units, they're important. To solve the simplest version of this problem, we could be given quantities for some of these variables that are already in the same units as R. So in this example, we are given V, N, and T, and we want to find P. So first we solve the equation for P, then we plug the values in that we are given, Notice that most of the units cancel out directly. And finally, we get the answer. It is quite tempting for these kinds of problems to try to avoid all this writing by leaving off the units. Do not ever do this. I repeat, do not do this. Writing out the units at every step will solve at least half of the errors in general chemistry. Without dimensional analysis, you won't know you've made a mistake in the calculation. With dimensional analysis, you'll often find a result for a mass that's in units of something like grams liters per cubic centimeters, which is clearly wrong. So now we're going to tackle the same problem, but with some unit issues thrown in. Suppose we are given the volume in cubic meters instead of liters and are asked for the answer in tor instead of atmospheres. We set up the problem the same way, but include steps to handle the unit conversions. First from meters to decimeters, notice that the conversion factor is cubed, and then from cubic decimeters to liters. Finally, the pressure is converted from atmospheres to tor. If you don't follow all of these steps, I recommend that you pause this video and examine this expression until you do, maybe even writing it down and, and canceling out the units to see what you're left with. We now have the tools we need to answer a common question in chemistry. How much product do we get when we start with a certain amount of reactant? This type of problem is called stoichiometry, and we will solve it using a slightly extended version of dimensional analysis. So let's start with this example. What mass of carbon dioxide is formed when 10 grams of propane is burned in air? We'll start by writing out the balanced equation. As you should know by now, combustion or burning is the reaction with atmospheric oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water vapor. Write that down as a balanced chemical equation. To keep track of what I know and what I'm looking for, I tend to annotate this equation with that information, like this. So now that we have the problem set up, let's think about how to solve it. 
we need some way to get from an amount of propane to an amount of carbon dioxide. The concept that lets us do this comes from the stoichiometric coefficients. For every one molecule of propane, three molecules of carbon dioxide are formed. Similarly, one mole of propane produces three moles of carbon dioxide. We can use this relationship to form a conversion factor for use in dimensional analysis, called the stoichiometric ratio. This stoichiometric ratio is the essence of stoichiometry. So the basics of stoichiometry are get from what you know to moles by whatever means necessary. In this case, we start with 10 grams of propane. Converting to moles means using the molar weight of propane. Next, use the stoichiometric ratio. Make sure you have the right part in the denominator to cancel. And finally, get from moles to what you're looking for. In this case, grams of carbon dioxide. All of stoichiometry will use these three steps. The first and third step may involve multiple conversions because you won't be going to or from mass, but the essence of the procedure is the same. Figure out how to get to moles, use the stoichiometric ratio, and then figure out how to get from moles to whatever you're asked for. Sometimes when a reaction has multiple reactants, you run out of one of them before the rest. Naturally, it's going to matter which one you run out of first when you're trying to determine how much product you are able to make. This is what is known as a limiting reagent problem. Let's look at how we solve this kind of problem by starting with a bulk scale analogy. Suppose we are making three-legged stools. We have 12 legs and six seats to work with, and we want to know how many stools we can make. A common mistake that is made is to look at these numbers and say six is smaller than 12, so the seats are the limiting reagent, meaning that we keep making stools until we run out of seats. I hope you can see from this simple example, however, that this is not the case. You first run out of legs. Let's see how we would set this up and then solve this problem using chemistry notation. First, we need a balanced chemical equation. Don't forget your states of matter. Then we examine two hypotheses. Hypothesis one is that the legs are the limiting reagent. Hypothesis two is that the seats are the limiting reagent. In both cases, we use the stoichiometric ratio to determine how much product, in this case stools, we can make under each of the hypotheses. Whichever hypothesis makes less product is the correct one. Let's apply these concepts to a real chemical example now, as shown here. Naturally, the place to start is with the balanced chemical equation, which we should annotate with our starting information. Now, you could certainly follow the procedure I just showed you, where you make two different hypotheses about which is the limiting reagent and test to see which hypothesis is correct. I encourage you to pause the video and run through that yourself. However, I would like to show you that there are multiple ways to solve these problems, so here's another way to do it. Ask yourself the question, for all of the tin to react, how much iodine is needed? We'll set that up as a stoichiometry problem. Start with your known quantity, convert it to moles, use the stoichiometric ratio, and convert to grams. But we only have 40 grams of iodine. So that means the iodine is the limiting reagent. Think about this for a minute. I spent the last slide going through a procedure where you set up competing hypotheses and you compare them by calculating for each hypothesis how much product would be made. But here, just by thinking about what the problem means, we've asked a different question and still gotten the answer. I've said this before, but it's worth repeating. You will have a much easier time with chemistry if you don't treat it as a series of procedures to memorize. If you just memorize procedures, then you'll be limited to being able to do calculations that are just like the ones you've seen before. If instead you treat chemistry as a set of relationships between quantities, then you can tackle completely new problems by thinking about how those relationships work. And that is the kind of thing I'll be asking you to do on exams. Okay, so let's keep going with the problem. Even though the question doesn't ask this, it might be nice to know how much tin iodide is actually produced. Hopefully by now you can see that this is a very straightforward stoichiometry problem, starting with the limiting reagent. If this doesn't immediately make sense to you, then please pause the video to look over this step in more detail. So now that we have this information, let's look at how to answer the rest of the original question, how much excess tin is left. We're going to look at this in three different ways to answer this question. All of them work fine, and all of them come from understanding the relationship between the quantities. So approach one, basic stoichiometry. We take the amount of limiting reagent, 
and find out, using the stoichiometric ratio, how much tin must be consumed to fully react with it. Then how much is left is equal to the amount that wasn't consumed by the reaction. If this approach doesn't make sense, pause the video to examine closer. Approach 2. Conservation of mass. Mass cannot be created or destroyed. So if we take the total mass of the reactants, subtract the total mass of the products, the remaining mass must be the amount of leftover reactants. Again, if this approach doesn't make sense, pause the video to think about it a bit. Approach 3. What I might call chemical reasoning. All of the 40 grams of the iodine become part of the tin iodide. Therefore, the remaining 9.35 grams of the tin iodide must come from the tin. Therefore, the amount of unreacted tin must be 0.65 grams. All three approaches give the same answer. For our last topic in stoichiometry, let's look at yield. Consider the reaction where ethanol reacts under some unspecified conditions to give ethylene and water. The formulas are shown here. For some organic compounds, not all elements are grouped together when the molecular formula is written. Don't worry about the details of this yet. Let's suppose we start with 100 grams of ethanol. How much ethylene should we expect from this reaction? Running the basic stoichiometry tells us 60.9 grams of ethylene. If we went into the lab and actually ran this reaction, do you think we would actually get the predicted 60.9 grams of ethylene? Pause the video and think about it for a bit. If your answer is no, then think about why we might not get that predicted amount. Back from pausing. If you said that we would not get that much, you're right. There might be side reactions where the re reactant reacts but forms some byproduct rather than the desired product. Or the reaction may simply not go to completion, leaving some unreacted ethanol. There may even be experimental losses. As the reaction occurs, we might not experimentally be able to capture all of the product. The theoretical yield of the reaction is this predicted 60.9 grams of ethylene. The actual yield is whatever you get in the laboratory. The percent yield is the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield times 100%. Percent yield can become extremely important in multi-step syntheses. For example, Imagine a series of reactions where the first step is 80% efficient, the next step is 80% efficient, and so on through the list. If you take this list and multiply the percentages, you find the overall yield is only 4.6%. This is one reason for high prices of some pharmaceuticals.